wild regions of New Zealand, a powerful monster terrorizes those who dare to venture too deeply into the forest. There was something standing there looking down at him like this. Bristles on the back of your neck would start to stick up and he reached up and grabbed hold of this thing. They call it the Moihau. And when the others came back, there was Frank standing with three feet of beard in each hand. Nothing would stop a hairy wild man from Moihau. so tall and so proud I stand before you I'll say it out loud I've come to play and I hope you don't mind sharing with me some quality time this song is still heard in rural New Zealand it's about the Moihau nicknamed the hairy man it's a giant fearsome creature resembling a gorilla reputed to have terrorized the earliest European settlers and even the Maori inhabitants of the South Pacific archipelago. It's on the beautiful Coromandel Peninsula that the most Moihau sightings have occurred, a region of unparalleled natural beauty and a paradise for outdoor enthusiasts. Keith Stevenson is a native of the region He's convinced that incredible things go on in the depths of these green woods. He can walk with and, and swing both arms and, and, and his head can certainly rotate around. But he was like he was, uh, he was disappearing. He, was, um, he wasn't coming towards anybody. He was obviously, obviously heard people and, um, and just wanted to get it the hell out of the road. So, um, and the best way to do that is get off the track. He's never very far away. Um, you can, um, if you're observant enough, you'll see his footprints from time to time when you, especially when you come to a place where the pigs like to, where the wild pigs, they like to wallow in the mud and, um, and that's how they cool off and, and they wallow all around. And sometimes you'll see where he's, where he's had to walk along that track. The footprints that we've seen aren't all the same size. So, um, that tells me that he's not up there on his own. Ray Russick is the unofficial historian of Coromandel. This sheep farmer has been collecting stories of the Moihau for over 40 years. According to him, the monster is definitely part of the region's DNA. He tells us one of the famous Moihau stories, that of the Wensley family, early settlers who had a terrifying encounter with the monster. Frank and Mick, his brother, used to hunt in the bushes, been outlined in that palm. And they shot a, a wild cattle beast, a heifer, and they couldn't carry it all home. So what they couldn't carry, they hung up in this tree on a piece of rope, at least eight foot high, okay? And when they went there in the morning to get the rest of it, it wasn't there. It was just a ragged bit of rope hanging down. All the claw marks on the trees where the thing had climbed up and grabbed this beast and pulled it down and all the claw marks on the ground and the meat had gone. Two hours from Coromandel lies Auckland, New Zealand's dynamic metropolis. Surrounded by extinct volcanoes and immaculately preserved beaches, Auckland is an ideal blend of nature and urban living. Of course, on these streets, no one fears the Moihau, but the legend of this mythical creature has managed to capture the imaginations of certain authors. One such writer is Nicola McCloy, she devoted a book to the mysteries of New Zealand. One chapter focuses on the enigmatic Moihau. I think that when a friend of mine told me about this story, I'm just like, I didn't know about this, this is great. Now I have to say that it's a, it's a very North Island story and I grew up, I was born and grew up in the South Island and we have our own, I mean it's quite a small country, um, but we have quite distinct mythologies and a lot of it is because the different Māori tribes and things but it's the same where you have quite distinct mythologies depending on where you are in the country and I don't know of anywhere else in the country where, where, these, where there's any sort of story like this. 
I think the other thing that I liked about it was that there were reports from the 1960s and 1970s. And so I kind of liked the idea that uh, whatever the story was, that there was enough in it and there was enough that kept people interested, that they were still talking about it, that people were still kind of conscious of the story when they went out into the bush, you know, so, so that there's this sustained tale telling. Over, over what is effectively half of the European history of New Zealand. You know, there's 100 years worth of, of, of stories or 150 years worth of stories, which is interesting to me because I think um, it's, it seems so unlikely, the possibility that there's, that there's a, a, a creature there that's the equivalent of a Yeti or a Sasquatch or something like that. Oh, I've never seen him. I've never heard him, but uh, he must be there. A chain of mountains nearly untouched by human activity crowned the beautiful Coromandel Peninsula. This is one of the regions with the greatest biodiversity on the planet. The highest mountain, whose summit is 892 meters or 2,925 feet high, is called the Moihau. It's here that the terrifying creature is thought to make its home. The, the, the Moihau man name comes from Mo Mount Moihau, which is the highest point on the peninsula, which is actually quite far north. But there have been reported sightings sort of all over the peninsula. Um, and, and I guess what, I guess the geography there is, is part of what feeds into that mythology, because a lot of it is still in, in quite dense native bush. It's a sacred place to a lot of, a lot of us. It's um, Papatuanuku is um, Mother Earth. And, and of course, on Mother Earth, there's lots of sacred places. Um, for us in Coromandel, um, I, to me, um, Moiho would be one of the more sacred places on, on the Coromandel Peninsula. And I think that would apply to most people um, who live in Coromandel and have lived here for a long, long, long time, would, um, would all have that respect of it being a, a sacred place. Yeah. So it's, it's spiritual, and, um, and so we respect that. So. It's quite inaccessible, um, and you can drive around the, the edges of the peninsula, but getting into the hinterland is pretty tough. So it, it's pretty rugged country. And there's some very unhospitable parts up there that, that um, people wouldn't even attempt to go to. It's, it's, um, it's probably too steep, too dangerous, um, and there are sometimes some places in the bush that you just don't even want to go there. You know yourself, you won't, no, it's not for me. Um, I think I'll go back the other way, or I think, yeah, I think you would know if, um, if you were within the, in the sacred area, the bristles on the back of your neck would start to um, stick up, you'd, you'd feel that you shouldn't be here. Yeah, it's like that. The Moihau is described as a cross between a gorilla and a man, standing up to three meters or 10 feet tall with a black or dark brown coat of fur. It is incredibly strong and responds aggressively to human presence. It feeds mainly on wild pigs. Uh, definitely something that's, yeah, a, a little bit, um, yeah, oversized uh, human. Um, walking quite, quite tall, um, but a little bit hunched. Very unusual footsteps. Very, very big. Um, only three, only three um, toes. Uh, big toes in the front on each foot, and 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 just a small one out the side. The descriptions really change. The only thing that's consistent is that it's within the Coromandel region, and that it's this this ape-like creature. Unlike Sasquatch and Bigfoot, monsters for which there are hundreds of testimonies, the Moihau is very discreet. Nicola McLoy has studied the few modern testimonials from people claiming to have seen the monster. In 1969, there was a sighting of a woman called Vera Marshall, uh, who, who believed that she'd seen the Moihau man. She was out walking in the bush and believed that in the distance she'd seen a large gorilla-like creature, and she described it as being gorilla-like. Um, and when she, obviously, when she got back, you know, she reported what she'd seen to various people, and, and when, you know, I think some believed her, some didn't. She, she 
the, the main description that exists now was that she said it was a gorilla-like creature and that she'd seen it off in the distance. But it was quite clear that it was the size and shape of a gorilla. But how has so discreet a monster managed to play such a large role in New Zealander folklore? The answer lies in a strong oral tradition typical of the Coromandel region. Kiwis are great storytellers, and I think it goes right back, you know, it, part of it is our, our Māori history, our indigenous history, is that it was, um, until, until really the Europeans arrived, it wasn't a written language, so it was, an, it was always an, the, the oral tradition. So stories was, ha were handed down generation to generation. There's another story which I've heard several times about, I'm not sure where this was, somewhere down the Maui, I think, where there was Frank and Mick and a couple of other bushmen, they're felling bush for somebody down there. The, a lot of our settlers were Irish and Scots, so they had that real Celtic thing where they loved a good yarn. In the middle of the night, they had two bunks on one side, two bunks on the other side, and old Frank was in the bottom bunk on one side, and he woke up in the middle of the night, and uh, there was a bit of moonlight coming through the door doorway, and there was something standing there looking down at him like this. And he let out a yell, and he reached up and grabbed hold of this thing to wrestle it, to whatever it was. The others got a hell of a fright. They charged out through the door and were gone into the bush. And Frank wrestled with this thing in the dark and wrestled and wrestled, and the, the noises coming out of there terrified the rest of them. They just wouldn't come anywhere near the camp. And finally, this thing broke free and charged out through the side of the, didn't go to the door, charged out through the side of the sneak out worry. And when the others came back, there was Frank standing with three feet of beard in each hand. So whatever it was, wouldn't have much beard left. It wasn't a pig, that's all I know, it wasn't a pig. It could have been a deer, it could have been a hairy man, who knew? <laughs> For the Maori, Mount Moihau is a sacred place. It is the burial site of the warrior chief Tamateka Pua, who organized the great migration of Polynesian Maori to New Zealand in the 14th century. In addition, the original inhabitants of New Zealand lived in symbiosis with the earth. The Maoris revere Papatuanaku, or Mother Nature. Was the legend of the Moihau begun by the Maori to scare off European settlers? The Moihau itself is a sacred mountain. It's the highest point down there, and it's sacred to the Maoris. And they didn't like anybody uh, climbing this mountain. Okay, because that's where the last place of the spirits used to fly away from, the top of this mountain. And they got onto the hairy man story, the Maoris did, and they warned people not to go up there. Partly because they didn't want them up there, partly trying to scare them with this hairy man story. I have read accounts where, where they've said to people, don't go out of, of the village at night because there's these scary creatures whether that was something that they were doing in order to, to frighten people from coming near the village, from other villages or from other tribes or other groups coming near the village at night, or whether there was actually something, a spirit that they believed was there but wasn't, or whether there was a creature there. I, it's hard to say. Oh, Mary is a very superstitious people, uh, the old timers, nowadays they wouldn't, of course. But uh, those days, yeah, they were pretty sincere. And if they got a story in their mind, it was pretty soon gospel. And um, they'd really believe it. Normally, Mount Moihau and its surroundings are rough going for tourists. But one man was determined to explore it. The artist Barry Brickell developed a tourist attraction that has drawn over a million visitors to the area the Driving Creek Railway, which winds its way through this seldom visited forest. Having been lived in the middle of Auckland City for all my young days, I wanted to move out into the country. I came to Coromandel in 1961 as a school teacher, but I did not like school teaching at all. I hated it. And because I already knew how to make pottery, I started to be a full-time potter, made my living from that ever since. Also, I'm an engineer, and I built the railway, um, designed all the bridges and tunnels, and I bought this land, which is 22 hectares, that's about 65 acres, 
very cheaply in 1973. And I knew very well that if I built a, an interesting narrow gauge mountain railway on my land, it would attract a lot of tourists. So it took me 32 years to build the railway. See the, uh, the cloud lifting a little bit out there. That's, that's uh, Motu Oruhi Island. One of New Zealand's main tourist attractions is its stunning natural beauty, a fact that Barry Brickell exploits with a minimal impact on the environment. It must be said that New Zealand's flora and fauna are exceptional. Each native species is unique to the archipelago, a peculiarity that adds to the aura of mystery surrounding these wild forests where humans rarely set foot. You see, New Zealand didn't have mammals before Europeans and Maoris arrived. It was a land of birds, insects, and frogs and reptiles. There were no mammals in New Zealand. The only country of any size in the whole world where there are none at all, because we've been separated from the rest of the world for very, very long, millions of years. New Zealand broke off from the, the Greater Gondwana land really early. We have some quite spectacular, you know, spiders and butterflies and things, but we have absolutely no native mammals. So the idea, I think people kind of like the idea that there might be, you know, this, this weird kind of hominid creature out in the hills there. I think a lot of the fascination is around the fact that because we don't have native mammals, that we really kind of, you know, we're kind of like, oh, it'd be kind of good to have those. So that might be part of what drives the mythology as well. In the late 18th century, European settlers brought large mammals to New Zealand, upsetting the delicate balance of its ecosystem. But if species totally foreign to the island can survive and even thrive there, could a large, gorilla-like monster do the same? After all, New Zealand's biodiversity has become a kind of laboratory, an ecosystem shaped by human intervention. When Maori, to a small extent, and Europeans, to a large extent, introduced uh, furry mammals. They brought sheep and cattle for m meat and for milk. Um, they brought with them sort of deer and a lot of animals that we now farm. Possums, cats, pigs, just such a huge variety. Of and then there were an animals that were inadvertently introduced like shipboard rats, mice, Things like that, that you think, you know, what a great opportunity to have, you've got this island nation where you can stop things like this from being introduced. Didn't happen. They just ate everything they could find, because the birds didn't, half the birds in this country could not fly, they didn't have to fly. And so they just got eaten and almost destroyed, almost to extinction. And that's what happened, you see. That's why we build a wildlife sanctuary here, to save whatever there is left. The fence is to stop imported mammalian animals getting in and destroying the rare wildlife we have here. Do all these barricades protect Barry Brickell from the Moihau? Nothing would stop a hairy wild man from Moihau because he's magic. He can go through any fence a hairy wild man of Moe, how can even walk through a concrete wall? Uh, because it's a mythical figure, we don't have to worry about it. The spread of the Moihau legend is closely linked to the Coromandel Peninsula's 19th century mining boom. At that time, this area was totally unexplored. Everything remained to be discovered, especially the mysteries of this dense forest. The mining was a really, really colourful period in New Zealand's history, and it, it was it was a really key period. I think it, a lot of, brought a lot of money into the country. You know, brought a lot of money into the country when the, you know gold was sold. You, there was a lot of wealth that came from it. So it really um, it was, a, in a lot of ways, the backbone of the establishment of kind of um, uh, of 
New Zealand as we know it now, you know, the establishment of, of various cities. It was the miners who propagated the Moihau legend with stories of the terrifying hairy man dominating campfire conversation. But perhaps some of these immigrant workers had a personal stake in keeping certain areas of the wilderness off limits to others, areas that might be rich in gold or minerals. On the whole, they were pretty rough and ready sort of characters who um, probably, they, they, they worked hard and they played hard. When they earned their money, they liked to drink and they liked to tell stories. The, the stories that I've read, particularly uh, the reports in the 1870s, uh, around the gold mining times, the 18, 1860s and 1870s, um, it's always been a quite threatening, quite scary kind of creature. Uh, and that could be down to um, people trying to protect their, their, their gold claims. Um, it could also be down to the fact that the evenings were quite long and there was a reasonable amount of drink around. And, and there were a lot of people that, you know, these guys were here from all over the world and, and liked to tell stories. And probably some of them came from the California rushes, some of them probably came from the Yukon and, and you know, um, came from places where those stories were being told as well. So, you know, you kind of look at, you look at where they came from and where they were bringing those oral traditions from. So, you know, maybe that's where some of those stories came from. They used that story to sort of discourage people from sniffing around the bush too much. Uh, the, the miners wanted to go and explore it themselves, they didn't want other people in there and they just scare, or try and scare people from going in there to prospect. And the Maoris of course had their own agenda, they didn't want their spirits uh, interfered with up there. I can just imagine them sitting around a campfire of, of an evening, you know, and, and even the Coromandel it still gets pretty cold during the winter, you know, cold evening, couple of bottles of whiskey, got the fire going, and they would be telling stories, and each one was probably getting bigger than the other one, and they'd be trying to outdo each other. And, you know, you'd have a few guys who were just sitting there listening, having a laugh, but you can just imagine there being two or three of these guys who've just been everywhere and seen everything and just really want to tell a good story. One non-native species in particular, the wild pig, has reproduced throughout the region with devastating consequences for plant life. Its history is linked tightly with the Moihau legend, for it was in hunting these wild pigs that natives had many of their most terrifying encounters with the monster. He's looking pretty moth-eaten now, but uh, he was one of the bigger pigs I'd caught. You can see the big tusks that they have on them, eh? Mostly pigs are caught with dogs these days. You just go into the bush and the dogs will find a pig sign and go away on it and find the pig with a bit of luck. Uh, we have, um, hunted pigs, you know, all my life sort of thing. And uh, it's not so much now, but a few years ago, uh, we used to lose probably average of 60 or 80 lambs a year that the pigs would kill and eat them as they're about three or four days old. They, uh, they just go after a small lamb that can't run very fast and uh, catch it and eat it. And uh, they skin them a very, um, unique way where they go for the guts and pull them inside out and all that's left is the legs turned inside out, the skin, and the legs with the feet all bitten off, all just laying there like that. In 1972, uh, there's a couple of, of local lads who uh, went off up into the hills pig hunting. Beside their camp at Waiara there was a big rope swamp, I think it's not there anymore. And they had these pig dogs that were scared of nothing, these pig dogs at the head. And they love nothing more than getting out into really dense bush and hunting wild pigs. And the wild pigs up in those areas, they have not seen human beings before a lot of them. You know, it's really dense, really rough territory. And some of these guys will go for two or three days or longer, a week take provisions on their backs and just get right out into the back of nowhere. And one night the dog started growling and then they started whining and they sort of whining in fear and they didn't quite know what the story was. So they let the dogs off and they charged into this rapu swamp and there was a noise like a thrashing machine in there. The dogs came out again 
they weren't, they were so scared the hair wasn't standing on end, it was actually standing forward. That's how scared these dogs were. Back into their kennels and they wouldn't get out again. In the morning they investigated and all this rapu in the middle of this rapu was all beaten flat and this monster had gone. Other people had actually claimed to have seen it in a distance. A couple of pick hunters saw him somewhere on the ridge about 300 metres away and uh, by the time they got over to where he was, all that was there was the footprints. He'd gone. Pretty, pretty sort of elusive character, this hairy man. He didn't hang around. Once the creature had sort of ambled off, these guys claimed that they'd gone down and had a look at where he'd been standing, looked at where he had been, and that in, in that place where he had been, obviously there'd been a bit of rain, it was a bit muddy or something, because they, they reckoned that they saw a, a footprint. A, a sort of an ape-like footprint, but that it was 35 centimetres long. I've done quite a lot of hunting in the bush and myself and that, and I've never seen any sign of any hairy man. But bearing in mind that he actually lived down Waiara in that area down there, where I've never hunted. Now, I've hunted a lot of this country, but not down there. But I think if you ask some of the hunters down there whether they've ever seen the hairy man, some of them might claim to have. One man knows the Coromandel region better than anyone. Marcus Ward, a farmer who has lived in the shadow of Mount Moyhow for 70 years. He's familiar with the legend of the hairy man, but he walks his land and the wilderness without fear. Well, I've been there all my life and I've never seen it. My grandmother, she was there for 65 years and she never saw it. Never seen his footprint or Never even seen where he could have been, you know, no big marks or, you know, how bears make marks on trees, well, nothing like that. And we've done search and rescue up there, getting people out with broken legs and limbs and that type of thing. So we've had ample opportunity to look around. People seem to think it's a fact. And I think it's just a very delightful bit of fiction. My sense would be that there, that there is something that is the basis for these stories and that they've been sustained through that oral tradition and through that real love of, of spinning a good yarn and telling a really good story. Some stories say that it's some kind of hominid creature, some stories that it's some kind of ape creature, but that it, it just seems so completely unlikely that there are there is this, this creature in a country that has nothing but birds and lizards and frogs. Over the years, many non-native species of animal have been introduced to New Zealand. Is it possible that was the case with the Moihau? Could the Moihau be just a gorilla? I would find it hard to believe that it's something that has survived since the country split from Gondwana land. Um, so for me, I think that the, the basis of it probably has come from stories of, of animals coming off ships. It, it could well be that there was that there was um, gorillas, you know, go missing from circuses or, or off ships in the 1800s. There were exotic animals being brought here for entertainment in, as early as say, I think, I think around the 1860s. So it's not outside the realms of possibility. One of the stories is that there was sailing ships, which used to be numerous those days, of course, cutting timber away from Coromandel and the Moa down there further. And they quite often had mascots on the boat. Uh, and the story is that this mascot was a gorilla on one of these boats and he got ashore. But he must have taken a girlfriend with him because or else he lived for 200 years, I don't know. And uh, he just lived in the bush. If it was, say, two animals in the 1870s, you would think that by now, and, and there's still sight sightings in 1969, 1972, you would think that by now there would be a reasonably large community. So I find it hard to believe that there's still in existence today. But that's not to say that there wasn't something that, that out there that had maybe come off a boat um, during the, from the traders in the 1860s, 1870s. It would have to be at least one male and one female, or a pregnant female, um, and then you're going to have breeding issues. But that, that there would be a significant population by now, if indeed it still existed. And I think if there was a significant population by now, then perhaps there would be more, re more regular sightings. 
It's possible that alcohol loosened the tongues of travelers to the Coromandel region, people eager to frighten and entertain one another with stories. Sometimes in the wool shed, after shearing, you'd always have a couple of beers and it might be in a couple more beers and then the stories come out and all the rest of it. Some people scoff at the stories and some people get intently interested in the stories and the storytellers get um, more and more into it and this is how it goes. Often after they'd been at the pub, you know, that helps to tell a story. And there's another story about a couple of guys in a car. They'd been to the, the uh, Coromandel pub. They're heading home. They got on top of the hill somewhere not far from Coromandel and out of the tree that was overhanging the road swung this apparition. Swung down the tree and landed on the road in front of them. They stopped the car, put it in reverse and backed all the way back to Coromandel, to the pub. One was a Maori guy, one was a Pakeha guy. And when they charged into the pub and grabbed their first drink, slowly the colour came back and this Maori guy, he got so, such a fright that he was so pale they thought he was a white guy. Never set eyes on him. <laughs> and I don't think I ever will. I think we get a lot of people who, who do a little bit of um, um, making out they know a lot more than what they do. And it's only because they've, they've heard a little bit and then they've added a bit more to it. We might not hear anything or anybody say anything for 10 years. Um, and then we might, we might get something that might turn up in, in, in the paper with a, with a picture or somebody might have been up the Cape there somewhere, um, maybe come ashore in the kayak or the boat, um, might have, you know, seen something that they thought, geez, I haven't seen one of that, like anything like that before. But always there are those with a keen interest in the monster and regular forest goers continue to collect clues and strange sightings that revive interest in the legend. There's uh, stories about how they found him, evidence of him living in caves and all the rest of it, and bones and things there. We think we come across somewhere where he was staying one time in one of the, in one of the caves. Um, there was uh, quite a lot of excrement at one end of the, of the cave and um, it certainly wasn't normal human. Um, and um, stuff off, uh, he would have been eating, maybe he might have cooked up a couple of possums or had a bit of wild pork or who knows, but there were certainly bones. So, and we found more than one spot, um, but, and the footprints, but no sighting. I think probably the early settlers before the Europeans got here, perhaps they used caves to put bodies and store remains in, that would be what that person saw. I think it's a lovely story, but I have a feeling it's just a very good legend. And it causes a lot of interest, you know, we like to talk about it or laugh about it. But I do have my doubts. Marcus Ward and his wife, farmers who've lived in the area for a long time, do not fear the Moihau. On the contrary, they think the monster legend makes for a great children's story. Anne Ward even wrote one for her grandchildren. You can drive the book. Once upon a time, there lived two boys, and they lived with their parents at Murray Howe on the Coromandel Peninsula. One day, Simon and John decided to go on a really big adventure. They were going to hunt for the ugly Murray Howe monster. In the middle of the night, there was a noise. The noise sounded like footsteps coming closer and closer to the hut. Then they heard a second sound. It was not frightening. It sounded like someone crying. I'm lost, I'm lost, said the monster. I've just come in out of the cold. I'm really friendly. We won't eat you if you won't eat us, said Simon in his big daddy voice. Really, he was not scary, like the people thought, but a very kind and gentle monster. That's a good little story for little children. Anne's read it at the play school and the little kiddies love it. Despite the scarcity of evidence, and even if the Moihau no longer dominates everyday conversations in the Coromandel Peninsula, great care is taken to preserve its memory in popular culture.
I have 14 monsters. <laughs> Yes, we we have um, we have Mo as our monster really, and so Mo comes from the legend of the Moihau monster, and the monster himself is a bit is quite a scary image, um, but Mo is a little educational, fluffy, muppety character that. Uh, has, de has evolved from that into a New Zealand based program that actually all kids seem to really relate to more than a lot of the overseas TV programs that that are available um, and because he, he's located in New Zealand and goes to places they know um, it's cool it's fantastic uh, and they often talk about him and still draw him in the classroom for the children of New Zealand, is the Moihau more myth than monster? Has it lost its historical dimension? He's Mo, he's not a real monster, he's just a puppet. They often will refer to Mo as what, if we're doing alphabet work, they talk about seeing the alphabet on Mo. Um, but a couple of the children in the class live up on Mount Moiho, and so they have a relationship with the stories of the monster itself, um, and the monster with the sharp nails that catches fish and catches people. And they haven't really made the connection between the Mo program and the, the monster on their mountain. They, they're two different entities to them. Caretaker died two weeks ago. He believed that he had seen him several times, um, and there are people in the community who believe that he's real. One, one of the wee chaps, he's away today, um, goes pig hunting regularly with his dad and he believes quite vehemently that he's experienced the monster, that he's seen him when he's been out pig hunting. They become more aware of it, I think, as they get out into the bush. A lot of the children start going pig hunting with their fathers when they're seven, eight, and that's really when the stories start to surface. Yeah, so the shadowy creatures that follow them. I know that being in the bush can be scary, and you could imagine a monster out there. And they have sharp claws like this. Do I personally think it's real? Probably not. But. There's, lo there's lots of ways of explaining phenomenon, and that doesn't have to be in our terms. It's, it's certainly in the, in the forest, and there are a number of people around who believe that they've experienced it. I suppose if you easily got the jitters and got frightened, you could make it do all sorts of things in your imagination, couldn't you? For her part, Nicola McCloy, author of the book on the mysteries of New Zealand, considers herself a moderate skeptic, but she believes the moihau to be more than just a fable. In this country, we have had birds that have been declared extinct. There's a, a bird called Takahe in Fiordland, and it was declared extinct for years. Everyone was like, no, nah, that's it, we're not, there are no more. And Geoffrey Orbell went off into Fiordland and discovered a, a population of Takahe. So, you know, even though it seems like a small country, you, 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 never, you never can categorically say it's, that's not there. I, fi I think that the, the, the weight of evidence would, would suggest that it's not, purely because the, the chances of an early hominid surviving the split from Gondwana land when there is no other mammal life here unlikely, and then if the other scenario were to be true where there was gorillas or, or apes of some sort that have escaped from ships, you would have to have had two, and then you would have, 150 years later, you'd have a sustained population. It would be really hard to hide. But again, you know, it's difficult to, to say never because there have been these creatures that have been declared absolutely to be extinct and have, have been rediscovered. So there are parts of this country where you just never know what's going on there. The legend of the Moihau doesn't just survive in children's stories. The legendary strength of the monster has inspired a popular sporting event in New Zealand. 
And naturally, it's a grueling, limit-testing competition. The, for years, they had a, a multi-sport race down on the Coromandel, so uh, I think it was a kayak, bike, run race. Um, you know, really tough race, which was actually called the Moiho Man. So the person that won it was the Moiho Man for the year. So, you know, it, it is quite anchored in the mythology of the area, yeah. Some say you have to be mad to attempt the Moiho, a 116 kilometre slog on sea, bike and foot. Keith Stevenson, a Moiho fanatic, is one of the organisers of this race. In the adventure race, you're always off in the bush somewhere or up a river somewhere else or um, exploring into all these different places. So it makes it exciting. Very good team building discipline and um, lots of fun. First, the first time we put a, an event on which started in Coromandel and we had to, we had to kayak, we had to kayak so far down going up north. And then we got out of our kayaks and then, and then we mountain biked right up around the top of the Cape, and then we did another run. And, and all the time, when we're doing all these different disciplines, we're working our way right around Mount Moiho. The route is 70 kilometers or 44 miles long. Is a meeting with the Moiho part of the bargain? It is the home of the Moiho monster, and, and you will be you will be up there in his area, um, so to keep a lookout. Um, and I know, I know quite a few of them were taking cameras in case they, um, you know, got a sighting. Yeah, I believe he's in there. Yeah, whoever he is, whatever he is. There's lots of new people come in and very interested, as you are yourselves, this hairy man has sort of kept it revived all the time keeping on reviving the, uh, the story and that's why it gives it legs and it just keeps going. If there's more people that go up into the bush, maybe someday somebody might be able to, yeah, stop and talk to him, who knows? It would be, be nice, nice to know how long he's been up there. You know, as you get older, you realise the value of those stories, whether they were true or not doesn't matter, but um, you, didn't sort of value them when they were told to you. And you try and recall these stories and uh, those are the only ones that I can sort of truthfully um, pass on. In the end, is the Moihau nothing more than a good story? It hardly matters because New Zealand has fully embraced the legend. I like the, the myth and the stories that this has generated. I don't have to believe in anything if I don't want to. People love stories. Particularly children, they love myths and stories, don't they? Gets the imagination going. Any, on the Coromandel, anything's possible. Because it's such a, I mean, because it is such a, a wild kind of a place. And because there are, you know, communities there who don't want the intrusion of, of the attention and the intrusion of, of other people. It's, it's, there are a lot of you know, people there that have moved there in order to get away from the rat race. So they, they kind of want to just keep themselves to themselves. So maybe if they did see something, then they're not going to say anything because they don't want the attention. I think he has a right to his peace and his freedom. Um, and if he's got some secrets that he doesn't want to share, um, I think that should be his right. In our own way, I think we all respect that, but um, we'd still like to be able to catch up to him and, um, and have a conversation someday. <laughs> to keep the legend of alive, because it is rather a nice one, you must admit. He's never been known to do any mischief to anyone, so it's just a, a fable, really. Where else do you go to look for a monster that looks such a lovely place? <laughs>